name is Humphrey Hayange, as OGW, as Order of the Grand Warrior. And he is a Kenya International Sports Film Festival 2020 brand ambassador, a former Kenya Rugby Sevens team captain. He is currently serving as athlete representative at the National Olympic Committee of Kenya, NOC. And he was part of the Kenyan squad of the 2009 Rugby World Cup Series, reaching the semifinals and part of the Kenyan team that won the historic 2006 Singapore Series tournament. Welcome, Ambassador. Then we also have Mr. John O'Haga, who is a senior counsel uh, in, the, in the judiciary system of Kenya. We call uh, lawyers who are of a certain cadre senior counsel, very serious lawyers. And he is also a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, FCIA Arbitrators, and Rugby in Kenya. He is chairman of the Sports Disputes Tribunal of Kenya. Managing partner for Triple OK Law Advocates, LLP, and former rugby international player for Kenya from 1997 to 1995. A member of the all-conquering Mean Machine rugby team that won consecutive Kenya Cup campaigns in 1989 and 1990. And then we also have Tito Oduk. Tito Oduk is the director of rugby for Mamba RFC and um, ex-Kenya 15s international, ex-Kenya A coach, and e Mumba head coach. Tito is a New Zealand trained level three rugby coach and is a Kenya Cup winner, Enterprise Cup winner, two-time National Seven circuit winning coach, and a three-time Kenya Cup top points scorer. These are very serious people, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, on today's panel. And to be the moderator, we have a gentleman by the name of Michael Kwambo, and he's the media officer at the Kenya Rugby Union. So, without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Michael to moderate his panel. Thanks a lot, Chris. You're very welcome. Um, just before we go on, um, <laughs> I know we said we're not going to talk about rugby and Chris, but I'm sure the panelists will agree that Chris definitely looks like a prop forward. He would have made a good prop forward for any of the teams that each one of you guys played for. Good morning, guys. Um, this is Rugby in Kenya. It is great to see you guys, Humphrey, John Moore, and Tito. Um, we're just talking about on, rugby on, on, and... On, 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 uh, on, that note, on that note, let me just... Uh, <laughs> let me just uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got rid of the prop forward. I think he's gone for a water break. He'll be back. But um, just getting straight into it, we've all been in the game of rugby. And the first question I'll throw to each one of you, starting with uh, our senior, John Moore, is how did you get into rugby? I got into rugby. I first played rugby in primary school, actually. Um, I went to a school called Kitale Primary, which was then one of those um, sort of, um, um, well, it was a school which was a feeder school for schools like Changes and, um, and Nairobi School. And that's why I first played rugby. But rugby didn't really grab me until I went to high school at Alliance. And, um, that's, I got into the, I started off with baby calls and then junior calls and then I jumped to when I was in fourth form. So that's how I got into rugby. Thank you very much, John Moore. It's interesting that you mention Alliance High School because uh, next to you is Tito Oduk. He is also an alumni of Alliance. Uh, I think at this point, Tito, you're smiling hard. You are obviously elated by John Moore's story. How did you get into rugby? Okay, Tito, can you please unmute your mic?
Okay, I think as Tito is uh, sorting out his mic issues, let's get to Humphrey. Humphrey Kayange, pleasure to be with you on this panel. The question that I had shared with John Mo and with Tito, I'm hoping that your mic is on and your sound is good, is how did you get into rugby? Okay, we'll go back to you, Tito. Okay, John Mo, it seems um, our two panelists are having problems with uh, their sound and connectivity. Uh, as we set that out, I will get back to you with the second question, which was, what are your highest and lowest moments in the game throughout your high school and club career? Um... I think my highest moment actually was being selected to play for Mean Machine when I was in first year. And that's because when I got into into uh, UON, I actually thought I would maybe start off in second, second, second 15 or third 15 or something like that. Uh, because at the time Mean Machine was packed with changes and uh, patch guys. And they had a very... Um, uh, the, they had a very protectionist uh, view about playing for Mean Machine. And so when Bimbo, who had just taken over as coach, selected me in the first game of um, my first year against uh, KU, um, and I scored the winning block goal um, and became an instant star, <laughs> that was my highest uh, point. <laughs> um, in the process, of course, I had to displace um, somebody from that position. I actually started off playing at center because, um, um, because I believe Tito Kebati was then playing flyer for Min Machine. And Bimbo then moved me to flyer once he recognized that that's where my, my true, my true uh, skills lay. Um, my lowest point, I think, um, let me see. Um, <clears throat> ooh, what's my lowest point? I, I can't think of a low point with rugby, quite frankly. Uh, but I think I think it was um, it was when we were crushed. We were crushed by Pontypool. I think something like ninety-eight ten. <laughs> that was a really low point because I I, I really didn't believe. That uh, we could get such a hiding because they had such a powerful pack and they just played a 10 man game and um, they really just took the life out of us. And I never experienced that kind of rugby before. That was a really, really low point for me, but a learning curve in my career. Well, thank you so much, John Mo. I'm glad to note that Tito and Humphrey are back. So, Tito, first of all, just confirm that you can hear me. Hi, Mike. Hi, Tito. Um, as John Moore was telling us earlier, he got into rugby at the Alliance High School, a school that you also attended. I don't want to assume that that is where you got into rugby, but it would be great for you to <laughs> tell us your rugby journey as well. Uh, my rugby journey in brief, uh, uh, it started off in Lenana. Uh, my mom was a teacher in Lenana High School when I was a little kid, so, so I got to watch the likes of uh, Jimmy Waku running around, and those were my heroes uh, uh, growing up. So when I got to high school, uh, when I joined Alliance, funny things that rugby, uh, instinct, rugby wasn't my first choice. I was still more interested in playing football and uh, basketball with the uh, cool kids but uh, you know being 5 foot 11 can only get you so far in basketball and uh, I needed a sport I could uh, dominate so naturally I gravitated back to rugby and I found that I was much better than everyone else uh, <laughs> And uh, that's how my career took off. 
I uh, joined Mwamba after high school as an 18 year old. Um, two years later, joined Min Machine. Uh, then, uh, then joined Kenya Harley Queens after that. Then went back to Mwamba. So it's been uh, quite a journey. The process winning uh, a few Kenya Cups, a few Enterprise Cups, and uh, playing a couple of international games. Oh, thank you so much, Tito. Um, Humphrey Kayange, good morning. Glad to uh, have morning, you on the Mike. set. Uh, this is a question that we had already posed to the two other panelists, John Moore and Tito. It was about how you got into rugby. And it would be interesting to hear your story of how you got into what we call the beautiful game. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, good morning, Tito and uh, John. I think I share the same <coughs> sentiments um, sort of as Tito. Um, so, joined rugby in high school. I went to Saints. Um, <laughs> Please clarify <laughs> this Saints for, for those who don't know, for the school. <laughs> um, I went to St. Peter's Mumias um, up in the western part of uh, Kenya. I, I joined high school. When I joined high school, I, I mean, soccer was my first sport. I played uh, that for my first time in school. Um, and then there was uh, the team naming and team selection uh, for the soccer team for that year. Um, I didn't make the cut. Um, so during sports or games time, I used to walk around just look for, looking for something to do. I, must, <laughs> I might have passed through the volleyball and the basketball uh, courts before heading, getting to the rugby pitch. Um, and uh, that's where it started for me. I just joined in and uh, started running up and down with the ball. Um, I, um, athletics was my um, was my favorite sport in uh, primary school. So uh, with that speed, um, sort of just fitted uh, fit quite nicely with rugby and uh, playing as a center um, required quite a bit of speed. And um, that's where it started. I think I played uh, from that time um, onwards. Um, till the end of uh, sort of my high school period. Um, after that, I sort of had a gap. So I joined um, after high school, went straight into uni. I went to Jomo Kenyatta University. At that time, uh, the rugby team there wasn't um, quite popular. I think rugby was still growing in certain uh, parts of uh, with, with the university in certain sports sec and, and uh, environments. So at JQuart, I ended up just uh, studying for the four years. And after I finished, I think uh, that's when I joined uh, Ulinzi Rugby. And uh, sort of just my path started to chart forward from, from that place, because I joined Ulinzi and, and the other, and, and later on the national team. So for me, it was an interesting journey, because I, I, I really wanted to play soccer in high school. I didn't make the cut, so found myself into a rugby pitch, and uh, um, that's where the story began. All right. Um... For you and Tito, because John Moore had already answered this question, what are your highest and lowest moments in the game? We'll start with you, Humphrey, and then Tito can take over. Uh, thank you, Mike. I think uh, I've been part of rugby for a better part of 12, 13 years. Um, quite a few high moments, I think, um, um, personally and for the team. I think personally just getting... Uh, to get the call up, getting a call up to to join the Kenya National Sevens team was was really an achievement. I think when I started playing, um, I used to watch um, and see the likes of Benja, the likes of um, uh, Dennis Mwanja, the likes of uh, Pablo Murunga Senior. I think I think uh, uh, sneaking into South Africa Sevens and watching them play during the Sevens was a highlight of my uh, pre rugby days. Uh, but just getting to call, be called up and uh, Playing the game at that level was was a huge achievement, and and uh, I, I was very honoured to do, to have that. Um, a few low moments, uh, just in terms of um, I think you start playing rugby, you start getting some good results, um, so I'm getting the opportunity to travel and uh, travel the world and, and play this amazing game in in in, in various continents. Um, the it comes with with you getting good performances and bad performances, so. I think to 2010, 2011, 
2012 was a period where we didn't we were out on the road and didn't get very good results i think um that's where you get as a team and you think that this is not working anymore and you're doing everything you can to be better but it's not working and uh, those are quite low moments for me but then again uh, as in sport you have your down and your ups and downs so that was a down moment and we came back after that and uh, went back to to playing the the game and getting the results we we trained for thank you very much humphrey over to you tito yeah some of my highs in rugby uh definitely uh remember the first time I won a Kenya Cup uh, it was quite a crazy game you know Tito so, maybe just to interject you played for a number of clubs so where did you win the Kenya Cup <laughs> just for the unschooled I <laughs> <laughs> uh, won it with the uh, with the Kenya Harlequins I remember it was a uh, it was a last minute drop goal against Impala so it was quite a game um uh, and also being named uh, to the national team was uh, was quite a surreal moment for me uh, i didn't expect it uh, that season given how it had started i was in machine 2 uh because i wasn't training that well uh then i came ill then I had to work my way up up uh, to the team and by the end of the season I was starting for Kenya so it was uh, that, that was quite a crazy journey uh the low moments obviously uh as a sportsman is when you're injured <laughs> I remember in uh, 2007 I twisted my knee very badly uh, in training and At that point I was getting back into some serious form and it really took the wind out of my sails. I think that's uh, at that point I stopped playing in the back line because it was just uh, I it had taken uh, it, it took too much out of me to get to that level and thinking of trying to get back to that peak was a bit difficult for me so that injury definitely was a low point for me but uh, it also gave me perspective in life and when i changed positions i also i ended up becoming very good at uh being a back row so yeah uh, those are th- those those have been my highest and lowest moments and obviously the first time i was named at alliance uh, to start for the team as a form 2 that was clueless as to what was happening in the pitch that was also a high moment before it became a terrifying moment against the rugby school well thank you so much um you know we are lucky to be graced by the presence of three former kenya internationals in various versions of the game Humphrey Kayange John Mo Ohaga and Tito Oduk which leads me to the next question to all three panelists we'll start with our senior John Mo Can you describe what it felt like getting to don the national team colors for the very first time? Um wow, yeah. That was an amazing amazing moment, especially because um like Tito, I wasn't really expecting to be named. Um at the time um machine hadn't yet won won anything and um And, and and when i looked at the other teams i thought that perhaps i wouldn't make it that year uh, but when i was named in the initial <clears throat> um i think i was named in the initial provisional like 36 and i thought okay it's just to make up the numbers um and then we had the trials and i was named to start for those days we have um, chairman that is uh, kenya possible or probable or whatever I was named to start for chairman uh, 15 um and then when 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 it came time to name the actual team I was in the team and I was named in the first uh, 15 and that uh, that was absolutely amazing uh, it's very difficult to describe the feeling um it's it's just such a sense of pride such a sense of um, something that you want everybody that's that's important to you to be part of 
And that's that's just how I felt about it at the time. Um, and, and to date, it is a feeling that I will never, ever forget. It really is amazing. Thank you so much. Over to you, Humphrey. Um, <clears throat> I, I think for me it was... Um, it was a mixed one in terms of, uh, of, um, of how it went through. Um, so I, I played for Lindsay for a season and uh, got called up to the national team. Um, uh, using, uh, you used to have trials and then you get named and the final team to travel is named. Um, I think I, I'd been playing quite well um, in the seventh circuit. So I... I did well in the trials and got a nod to travel to Dubai, I think, uh, that year, that season. Um, uh, I think the last, so for me, the last um, training session before we travel, I think we usually have, uh, I mean, a last training session before you travel, um, I got tackled uh, awkwardly and I sort of sprained my ankle. So at that moment i was like okay i'm not sure if i'll be ready to do this i'm not sure if uh, this is the first time i'm going out i'm traveling um how this will go of course the excitement to be on a plane and uh, get out to play for kenya for the first time sort of um was was really in in, in my head and i was like okay i guess uh, this will just die off by the time we get to the weekend get to dubai i get to don the national um, um colors and, and and represent my country um, unfortunately, got to Dubai, my ankle was so swollen, so the whole week I spent the, the time with the physios just trying to sort it out. Uh, come Friday, the physios are like, okay, we'll just drop it and uh, you'll get to play. Um, at that time, the guys on the team, Benja Benjamin and Oscar Osir, have come back from the from the UK. You have the likes of Bill um, Odongo. I mean, it's, it's, it's a star-studded team, and as I said earlier, these guys have been watching uh, from the sidelines and just thinking if I'll ever get there. Um, now I'm in that space. I'm, I'm with them in the changing room. Um, my ankle is still paining. I think it's been stout, but my my head is just that, um, will I play? Will I um, perform uh, and, and be at the level of uh, these legends of the game? Um, and it went badly. So <laughs> um how I remember my first time, it's the excitement and uh, um, and being able to play with some legends uh, on the team. But then again, on the back side, it's, 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 uh, I didn't really pan up. I think I got into the game, I played for, I think, a minute or two. My uncle, I was I was limping throughout the, the pitch in Dubai and I had to be substituted uh, after, after coming in as a sub. So... Um, I mean, later on in my career, I came to really appreciate and, and, and be privileged to every time to get the jersey on the team is being named and to feel that great sense of uh, honor and uh, and privilege just to 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 be be given this jersey. But um, from the start, I think it it wasn't something that I remember often. But I think uh, it's 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 uh, it's un it was unfortunate. But it's just mixed feelings for me. But uh, it, it is it, it was part of the process, I guess. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tito. <laughs> How much time have we got? <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll the second half is gonna be faster. Just relax. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's actually something I've been thinking a lot, a lot of, uh, over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, uh, I remember the first time. Uh, what have you been Kenny thinking a lot Kimba, about? Kenya, my 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 first uh, cup for Kenya. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I remember uh, KT uh, named me to start against uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, and at that point in 2002, Zimbabwe was still Zimbabwe. And I think the game was to be played on a Sunday. So you know how you've been training, you've been going well in training, but there is the reality that hits you when you've been named and uh, you realize there's no going back. So I remember that Saturday after K T named the side, and 
I was in a state of shock, to be honest. Because at that point, we had uh, the Gishukis was still around. I think Ken Aswani was still around. So there were quite some senior guys ahead of me. And uh, I, I grew up in Lenana with one Micho Jola. And I think the group was just back from the Commonwealth Games. And uh, so he had a bit of money in him. At that time, he was a broke university student. <laughs> So Mitch realized uh, his brother is in is in a state of shock, and uh, he took me to town. I remember going to that Barclays opposite Nakumad, the old the Nakumad that unfortunately burned down. He withdrew some money. At that point, I didn't have an ATM card, so it was still an amazing experience to me. Uh, he took me to the Kenchi up the road. I know guys know that Kenchi. <laughs> It was a popular stopover during our times. And he bought me half a chicken, chips, and you know that Madiaba. It was a cold fanta, I remember, on a Saturday afternoon. I think if we had proper nutritionists, then they'd be tearing their hair out, they'd be pulling their hair out. Because that's not the diet 24 hours to an international game. So he bought me that lunch, uh, talked to me, told me, This is what you've been working for towards. So you go out there and do your thing. So the following Sunday, you know that time there were no camps. You come from home. So whatever is cooked at home, that's what you eat <laughs> and go and play for the country. There's no special diet. Uh, I watched Zimbabwe warm up and being a center, obviously, for some reason, you're always marking the biggest back on the other side. It was a huge wild guy, and I was like, oh my God, I'm in trouble. Then singing the national anthem, which was fantastic. I mean, the crowd was amazing. Then kickoff. They're like, oh, here goes nothing. I'm going to blunder. I'm going to be subbed within 10 minutes. <laughs> I remember hitting the first rack. I was punched. That was my welcome to international rugby. And uh, my second uh, rack, I threw a punch. And I think for the rest of my career, I was throwing punches in racks. <laughs> the standard had been set. And uh, at the end of that game, we beat Zimbabwe. That was the first time Kenya had ever beaten Zimbabwe in a test match. So it was a fantastic debut for me. Uh, the party went on late into the night or early into the morning. Uh, and still today, it's one of my <laughs> fondest <laughs> rugby <laughs> memories. <laughs> and that is a abridged version from Tito Duke. Yeah, that's that's a abridged version. version. <laughs> 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 so, to my panelists as well, we've got three former internationals here. You've all been in the national team. The game has evolved over the years. We have a lot of activity in the 7s, 15s, under 20s and women's competitions. What do you take of the national team performances in all these categories over the years and do you think that the national teams are capable of even doing better on the continental and global stages? Once again we'll start with our senior John Moore. I, I, I definitely follow and track the performance of our national teams or of, of rugby in general because um, <laughs> I'm actually a rugby fanatic. Um, um, in fact, um, when I was in campus, my classmates used to ask if I was there on a rugby scholarship um, because I spent more time training and playing rugby than uh, studying law. <laughs> um, so when I when I look at the, I, I definitely definitely think um, Kenya has great great potential. Um, I think that um, from where I sit at the Sports Disputes Tribunal, certainly rugby's governance structure, I think, is, is one of the best in the Federation. And what that really generally tends to lead to is better performances on the field because I, I believe that governance is the foundation for performance in any sport, in any endeavor, really. Um, I know that there have been 
there's been um, issues about um, coaching, especially with the seventh team. I think that with the 15th team now, I, I think we've got stability. I know Polo Dera very well. He has coached my son. My son is, is really, really looking at taking up rugby and, and coach. Paul is a fantastic coach for him. And I think Paul will be able to take the 15th side places. I, I know that there have been mixed um, reactions to the reappointment of um, um, Lato. Narcos. Yeah. Narcos. Um, but I think that I think that he has the right um, he has the right um, what shall I say synergy with the team because um, players tend to follow their coach and really truly believe in their coach. So, for me, I, I think I see really, really, really great potential. With the women's uh, team, I, I really don't see anybody else um, that is capable of, of turning up against us other than South Africa. Um, and if we, if we get the players right, put them in the right environment, give them the right incentives, uh, which is really important for sport, we really should become a rugby powerhouse and be able to move on to the international stage and uh, get a World Cup place, and then it will be onwards and upwards from there. So I, I think we will do well, really. Thank you very much. And uh, remember, if you're joining us, this is uh, day three of the Kenya International Sports Film Festival. This is our panel discussion on rugby in Kenya. My name is Michael Kwambo. I have John Mo Ohaga. Humphrey Kayange and Tito Oduk on the panel. We were talking about national team performances and whether they can do better. We've just heard from John Mohaga. Now we will hear from Humphrey Kayange and Tito Oduk. Over to you, Humphrey. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, I think rugby, um, the national team performances over the years, uh, we've, we've had great strides. I think. Uh, with the sevens um, sort of just leading the front. Um, from the time I started joining the team um, to now, and even before that, uh, we've seen players coming in, performances improving um, from the different generations of players. Um, I think um, on a highlight in terms of the sevens, the win in Singapore um, was a good indicator of what we can do and what we haven't been doing. So. I think picking from that, those performances should go up. We've seen younger players, uh, more agile, strong, coming to the front and just raising their hands up to, to don the jersey and do well. Uh, so for the sevens, um, there's been a bit of off-pitch issues um, that are sort of interfering with them in, in terms of uh, even leadership and management and just echoing uh, John's sentiments in terms of changing coaches. Um, I mean, coaches having, uh, say, a year or so to come in and try and uh, uh, to get their philosophy going and then by, before they're done they're out again so there's been those off, off pitch issues uh, affecting uh, that setup but um, in terms of the players in terms of the growth of the game we've seen the circuit being very competitive locally which just means you get better players at the top um, so that that um, I mean post before corona we, we were looking at them having a very good season, uh, picking just on, on, on last season and seeing where these young players uh, can take the team. Um, so for that, I think they sort of have something going and, and, and for the sevens in terms of them sorting that, the off pitch issues being sorted uh, and the players are there, so just ensuring we empower and, and empower them and continue giving them the best um, training facilities, environment for them to perform is, is something that uh, should continue. Um, with the 15s, yes, uh, come a long way. I think I was part of the team that almost qualified to the to the Rugby World Cup. Um, I think we lost to Namibia, um, we lost to Zimbabwe after beating Namibia in, in Madagascar a few years back. It was disappointing because for the 15s, that had been their growth um, process. So they've come, they've come, they've spent some time in South Africa. They've got uh, they got training from uh, very. Uh, competent coaches um, and the performances were starting to show. Um, that loss in Namibia, of course, was was a huge dent, and uh, I think the setup has just been has recovered. Aside recovering from that and seeing how 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 they can uh, get the ne the next um, the next sort of um, campaign uh, for the next World Cup. 
That is closely tied in, I think, I think the way I look at that is closely tied in with, with the under-20s. Um, the under-20s with, with the tournament um, in Nairobi um, where they won versus Namibia in the final. I think, I think those players are the players that are moving up to the senior side. And uh, with, with, with Polo there just managing both the under-20s and the 15s just shows that his philosophy from the sort of the development uh, side to the senior side is, is is the same. So players who will step up from from the under twenties to the fifteens will probably be have been through the same coaching, same game plan, which is what we all talk about for the fifteens. We just need to we just need to have um, a sort of a team culture and team um, plan that is cascaded down to the clubs and to the under twenties to the under thirteens, so that players coming through they just know um, for me to play for the national team, this is what I have to do, this is what I have to go through. So those two are um, the under twenties are in good in a good place. If they are to translate into 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 the in the senior side the next um, World Cup or the other side the the, the the next two World Cups we should probably have another go at, at, at qualifying and that will open up um, in terms of, of in terms of their their achievements. The women's side, yes, been very good under uh, under Kevin uh, Wambua, um, who was uh, the women's coach. I think it's been picked up by uh, his assistant. But it's it's the women's game is growing world over. So for us as well, we've seen uh, women's tournaments being being the forefront of the KRU and uh, them promoting it in Africa. Um, the women's side coming. Uh, close second to South Africa, so usually just it's, it's a it's a toss of a coin for us to win if you're playing South Africa in the in the in the, in the sevens in the in the women's sevens uh, side. So for them, it's 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 on the same. I think we're in a good place in terms of players and and what we need to do. For us, just to focus and just see where we want to do what we want to give to these um, young players coming through opportunities in, in terms of exploring the talent and and we'll see the game now move to the next level. Thank you, Humphrey. Tito, waiting to hear from you. Uh, yeah, we. I, I believe overall we're on a positive trajectory with our, all our rugby representative rugby teams. Uh, the women have been doing quite well, and and watching them play, uh, they they really capture the ethos of the game and how it used to be played back in the day. And for them, I believe the sky is the limit, given the kind of... And all they need is a proper handling. And as Humphrey mentioned correctly, uh, I think Kevin Omboa has done a good job with them, and uh, Felix is also doing a good job. But we also have to... It would be... It won't be fair not to mention what Mwangi Mude has done for the ladies, because he practically revived women's rugby through Mwamba ladies. And uh, you can see the fruits of his hard work now. You can see all the clubs, the ladies' circuit is up and running. And uh, watching them on a Sunday afternoon, uh, the quality of rugby being played is quite high. You look at what Nakuru is doing, what... Uh, uh, Impala, Mwamba, uh, the KCB ladies team, the northern suburbs, uh, their circuit is uh, quite, quite competitive. On the men's side, uh, we are on the right track with the under-20s. We are building a team culture because the talent has always been there. So it's a question of having the, the proper pillars, the proper values, what we espouse as a team. Uh, to help us over the hump on to the next uh, stage. And I think we were almost there in 2015. It was quite unfortunate we didn't make that. Uh, it was quite unfortunate not to make that World Cup. But uh, I believe with the current setup, they are the team is on the right track. Uh, the proper players are coming through and they're beginning to realize what it takes to be an international and what to stay at that level. Uh, it's just not uh, your talent, but also your values as a person that will uh, determine how well you play and for how long we, we can stay, we can operate at a, at a high level. 
Thank you very much. And as uh, we come to the tail end of this panel discussion, there is a question that has come in from the audience. Thankfully, we had also thought about it. What can be done to further strengthen rugby in Kenya from the following perspectives? Number one, administratively. Number two, technically. And number three, commercially. Once again, we'll start with our senior, John Moore, then Humphrey, and then Tito Duke to close it for us. Um, interesting question, a very important question. Um, with respect to administratively, you know, I think I think we need to start with the commercial side of things because uh, the commercial side of things then underpins everything. And I think with the commercial side of things, it is really about how do we ensure that we can sell rugby um, as 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 uh, I, I always think about sport from the perspective of what would it take for me on a Saturday afternoon to bring my entire family to watch a game of rugby. Because really that's that's what you want to see. That's how you begin to commercialize the sport because then um, from there you can go into merchandising, uh, from merchandising, uh, you then better able to pay players better allowances, make them full-time professionals, um, that sort of thing. And so in my view, I think the most important person in that setup is uh, somebody in the in the role of a commercial manager who has the sense to know how to sell a product, um, to know how to sell a sport, uh, to move rugby to bigger, better premises into a, a stadium where um, you've got a gym and you've got, um, you've got all the facilities that underpin the ability to train and to and to enjoy the sport as well as to give spectators um, an experience when they come, you know, such as you would get in any developed uh, country. So that's that's what I see first. Uh, now, in order, of course, to be able to, to manage the commercial side of things, we really do need to have in place administratively people who think, um, who think from a governance structure, think about the game holistically, think about how to develop it from the grassroots, how do we develop rugby from, from being a, a sport where you could six, seven, eight year olds participating, different age groups cascading upwards um, and, and growing it that way, putting in place those structures and then having um, a route into the rest of the country so we can pick up players from from everywhere across the country. So you need a structure that covers the entire country, counties, uh, and manages the sport that way. I think that to do that, you need more full-time full -time professionals running the game. Um, and then when you come to the technical side of things, uh, you then need to manage each of these age groups uh, with appropriate equip them with appropriate technical skills, identify talent, keep talent moving, and at the very top, have a director of, of rugby whose job really is to look at the entire the entire game um, across the country and across all different age groups, and then um, have managers for the national team, um, have structures which enable um, as to have physios and to have um, strength and conditioning courses, you know, have all of those in place. But it all requires money, and I think in the end, it really is about commercializing the sport. That, that's, that's what I think. Thank you very much. Humphrey, what can we do to improve the game or strengthen the game administratively, technically, and commercially? Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, they say you never disagree with your senior, but I'd want to look at it differently. Um, <laughs> For a minute, uh, I thought you were going to disagree with him, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, I'd want to look at it differently. Um, so you asked administratively, uh, technically, and commercially. So where we are with rugby is we've got to that phase where 
we are moving from a sort of amateur, semi-amateur sort of environment to a professional environment. That being said, we if things are changing around us, we should all also try and adapt and change to to the changes because world over the game is the sport is moving and we don't want to be left behind. So administratively, there's there is we we as an organization, I mean and here I speak as, as care, you should look at our structure, our governance, our policies, which is what the senior had mentioned, in terms of being able being being able to have people on board that run to fulfill the mission of the organization so if we want to move rugby to the next stage this is what we need to do these are the people we need in place yes the bad side of that is that uh, they'll say oh we're still some some of the members at the KRU will, will be, still be on a volunteer based environment or somewhere that is not fully sustainable but uh, in terms of just knowing this is where we are this is the few steps we have to make forward so structure organization administration has to be on point to guide the game. So if this is left hanging, everyone moves the game to different directions and we're all pulling um, the same game that we have, thinking that we're all moving forward, but everyone is moving their own agenda. So that, that would be some area where we would want um, as an organization to be able to align so that uh, we are able to know, say 20, the next World Cup we are participating and this is what you need to do now. Then comes the people. So technically, what are we looking at? The game has grown. Rugby is being played on all over this country. So technically, do we, are we having uh, coaches uh, from a low level that are, are all registered, say, with the KRU, that all KRU will, will focus on improving them and ensuring that um, the philosophy is, is the same throughout um, throughout all these affiliates affiliate of federations or schools that are, are playing the sport. So... Um, Looking at it uh, from administration and technically, this uh, in terms of structure and organization, technical is just foundation and participation. And commercially is where John, uh, the senior, started from. After we package the game like this, commercially we're able to sell, commercially we're able to, to ask more from, from the donors because if didn't, the funders are come or partners are come, come on board and we do not have a product that is well packaged, we wouldn't uh, be able to fulfill their objectives and our objectives. Thank you very much, Humphrey. Tito. I'd love for you to wrap it up because <laughs> our first two panelists, uh, Humphrey and John Moore, have really been exhaustive. It would just be nice to hear from you for democratic purposes so that you don't say you have an opportunity to talk about this. In, in B -B 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 -I. B -B -I. Like a BBI yeah. thing. Watch out, watch out on GAPI. Anyway, mine, uh, you guys are eating into my time. <laughs> Anyway, my, uh, unfortunately, I'll disagree with my fellow Bulgarian here and just echo very quickly uh, Humphrey's point. Yeah, because Humphrey, you and Humphrey also played yeah. for the same club, Mwamba. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see, uh, KRU is the body mandated by World Rugby to run rugby in Kenya. So it, uh, so it doesn't matter what you do at the lower levels. If the upper level, the body mandated to run it is not up to speed, everything you do is in vain. And it gets to, and it brings my point, what is the qualification of being a director, being a chairman, you know, there needs to be basic standards to that. Because to be a coach, an international coach, you need to go through your training, you need to go through level one, level two, level three. Uh, to be a player, you have to go through your strength and conditioning, your rugby ready, uh, your... I mean, there are so many tests nowadays we make our players go through at the club. But for me to be a club chairman, there's nothing, there's no test I need it. To be a director, there's no test I will see it. It's just my wallet or my ability to rubble rouse. So there and that's where we get the we get a disconnect. There needs to be tighter scrutiny on who comes in at the top of the game, who runs the game. Once you sort that out, then technically you will have the right person coaching the players. You will have players who are up to speed. You will have proper referees without disputes and 
all these issues we get at times where we have. I think we had a point where Collins and Jera left a game, a Kenyan Cup game. We, we shouldn't be getting to such situations. And once you do that, it means you now have a viable product. And that product becomes very attractive commercially. Bringing in a sponsor becomes easy. Paying salaries becomes easy. Getting the team to prepare properly for international tournaments becomes easy because now you have a proper system that uh, your commercial partners have faith in. So it has to start from the top, then trickle down all the way. And that's the only way you'd come up with a commercially viable product that is sellable around the world. Thank you very much, Tito. Just as he pulled no punches during his playing career, he has pulled no punches there in his last point. Um, <laughs> so what you're saying is that uh, just looking like me will not qualify me to be the chairman of the Kenya Rugby Union. Um, I have to have... Uh, according to Tito's uh, scripture... <laughs> well, not, not on my watch. Not on my watch. <laughs> Remember, there's always a right arm just to say... <laughs> Now, it's interesting that today is uh, Saturday, and yesterday was Friday, and the former coach for Kenya Rugby, who's now coaching the United States of America, is called who? Yeah. It's called Mike. Mike, Mike Friday. Friday. Mike Friday. Mike Friday. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you here. And yeah, we'll talk about that uh, rugby situation maybe going in, going into the future. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> this has been the Kenya International yeah. Sports Film Festival panel on rugby in Kenya. And rugby in Kenya actually touches the world because um, we travel the world with our rugby teams. Uh, Kenya is known as a rugby playing country. As you just heard that now Mike Friday, who is the coach Kenya Rugby, is now the coach for the United States rugby team. So yeah. Charity begins at uh, home. <laughs> <laughs>